Good morning, and welcome to PSI in Practice. I'm Kim Jones. I'm the West Side Area Director for PSI. And the topic for this morning is the amazing adaptable human brain. And there are going to be two parts to our presentation. I'm going to begin by discussing some of the impressive research and discoveries that have been made regarding the function of the human brain by neurologists, psychiatrists, and others in recent years. And then Jane Moffitt is going to illustrate some of the applications of this new knowledge in the practice of psychotherapy. Now this is a huge topic, and it's one that we can only begin to touch on this morning. The brain is so very complex, and as Daniel Siegel says in his book Mindsight, quote, with more than 100 billion neurons stuffed into a small skull-enclosed space, the brain is both dense and intricate. And as if that weren't complicated enough, each of your average neurons has 10,000 connections or synapses, uh, linking it to other neurons. In the skull portion of the nervous system alone, there are hundreds of trillions of connections linking the various neural groupings into a vast spider-like, spiderweb-like network. And even if we wanted to, we couldn't live long enough to count each of those synaptic linkages. Siegel concludes, the brain is so complicated it staggers its own imagination, which I think is a good statement. Now given that complexity, I'm going to focus basically on one aspect of the brain this morning, neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain with the help of the mind to change itself through learned patterns of behavior, altering the ways in which the neurons within it are firing for the sake of adaptation, and integration. In this book, Mindsight, Daniel Siegel talks about working with a 92-year-old man who for most of his life had been detached from his feelings and he was brought to Dr. Siegel by his son because the man had been particularly detached in recent months from his family and his wife, had not been very communicative, and he had never been a warm, fuzzy kind of person. He'd always been rather distant, but particularly so in the months preceding his visit with Dr. Siegel. And Siegel found out that this man, having grown up with parents who themselves were distant and detached, had learned at an early age to operate, in Siegel's terms, more out of the rational left side of his brain at the expense of not having developed the right side of his brain where emotion, compassion, and empathy tend to be rooted. Siegel explained the two halves of the brain theory to this man and then worked with him on doing various body scanning exercises and mental exercises that by design stimulated both sides of the brain equally uh, to create more of an integration. And as he reports it in almost miraculous fashion, within a matter of months, the man began to express more emotion, to manifest increased signs of compassion and empathy toward the people he lived with. The family were very grateful, said, we don't know how you did this, Dr. Siegel. The man was expressing emotion that apparently he had never expressed openly in the 50 or 60 years that he'd been married to his, to his wife. Who says that you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Uh, one gets the impression uh, in reading this book that Siegel is an incredibly gifted psychotherapist. And, and as dealing with your question, uh, Kathleen, I think the, it's hard to know how much is due to what he's doing with the brain and how much is due to his, his personality, which is being shared with his patients. Uh, what's unique and interesting about his approach is that he relates almost all human behavior to specific areas of the brain and how those areas function. He does this very directly with his clients, at least in the numerous case studies that he presents in the book. But interestingly, as Siegel describes how he does this, it seems to have two immediate effects on his clients. First, it suggests that there is a physio physiological explanation that may not be the only explanation, but it's one explanation for what is going on, and that this can be remedied through specific exercises designed to create more of a balance or integration within the brain. And his clients react to this with a sense of relief. You mean there's an explanation for this, that you can show me what it is and we can actually do something to change it, to help it. So he lays out a kind of map with each client in the first session or two in terms of what they're going to try to achieve together in that respect. Secondly, 
Rather than becoming too intellectual a pursuit, the, the reassured client tends to relax and become more vulnerable and actually more open in sharing feelings in subsequent sessions. It's a wonderful technique and it really seems to work. And while this technique on the surface appears more behavioral or cognitive, certainly not, not uh, psychoanalytically probing, nonetheless, in using techniques such as body scans, meditation, and other things that I'll talk a little more about in a moment, Siegel seems to be able to, invo to evoke in his clients uh, the, those very repressed feelings, lo loaded early painful experiences, traumatic experience, all those kinds of things that those of us who use psychoanalytic techniques try to evoke in our patients, but he seems to do it in a very rapid fashion and it sometimes takes us months or even years to achieve that. Now, personally as one who attends a Buddhist temple and practices meditation, I've always felt that meditation is a very helpful practice for calming an overactive mind and for creating inner awareness and balance. And meditation is an important part of Siegel's practice. He teaches his clients how to meditate by focusing on slow, deep breathing. He then takes it one step further. Once one is able to achieve a meditative state, he suggests some guided imagery that can help one to achieve greater detachment from the feelings that emerge, often painful feelings. One image he uses is that of a wheel. He suggests that if you think of your mind being like a wheel, the core self exists in the hub of the wheel, and then spokes go out from the hub to the rim of the wheel where the activities and interactions of daily life are occurring. With this image, he suggests that from the hub or center of the wheel, we can learn to observe what's going on on the rim without identifying too closely with the rim itself. Now, one final example of being able to restore at least part of what appears to have been lost is the work of the neurologist Edward Taub, which is talked about in this book. We, uh, Taub worked with victims of stroke, particularly with stroke victims, and according to the theory of localization, as I said earlier, which was prevalent throughout the 20th century, that if you had a serious injury from a stroke, it was believed that you could do, you could make real uh, advance if you worked immediately, especially right after the stroke, and you worked several hours a day, but generally it was felt that what had not been gained after 12 months was probably not going to be. And if you, you know, after a year had passed, it wasn't likely that any further gain was going to be made. Dr. Taub has turned this theory on its head. Using a method that he calls constraint-induced movement therapy, or CI, he found that some patients who have experienced severe paralysis of as much as half of their body can, with the help of CI, within a matter of months, regain use of what was paralyzed, in some cases, for as many as 30 years. Now, there's no miracle involved here. It sounds miraculous. And when nerve tissue has died, it can't be resuscitated. I think there's general agreement about that. What Taub discovered was that in many cases where paralysis occurs, there is still some dormant neurological activity within the paralyzed limbs or tissue, and the, the nerves have not died totally. And with painstaking use of his CI method, which involves six to eight hours of hard work each day, sometimes just doing something as simple as trying to move a marble a few centimeters on a tabletop. But if one does that again and again, six to eight hours a day for days on end and for weeks or months, the paralysis can in many cases be reversed and totally reversed. So that one regains total use of the limb that had been paralyzed for years. Now, again, it's a, uh, the amazing adaptable brain. What both Siegel and Deutsch are suggesting in these helpful books is that the brain is a far more plastic, fluid organ than we ever thought possible, certainly that neurology as a science thought for hundreds of years. And as we learn more about how the brain functions, we can learn to find ways to alter its activity, to stimulate areas of the brain that have remained dormant to our detriment, or to calm areas that have become overstimulated. We can learn to take a more active role in reversing patterns of negative thought, of obsessive compulsive thinking and anxiety and even depression. Our knowledge of the brain obviously is still in its infancy because it's such a complex organ. 
But given what we've learned in the last 20 or 30 years, the picture is a very hopeful one. I think if you read these two books, you find them very encouraging and hopeful. We know enough now about the neuroplasticity of the brain to say that there is very little human behavior about which one can simply say, it's too late. This has been going on too long. It's too late for anything to, to be done about this or for this to change. Even where there is severe organic damage to the brain, incredi incredible things can happen. So with some caution and humility, I think our mantra can be, it's never too late. It's, and with our clients, it's never too late to do something. It's never too late to change. Okay, I've put a lot out there in a short period of time, so I want to allow some time now to open this up to discussion, to reactions, questions, and comments. Yes.